people in the house? Anyone? Go ahead, Gary. Given shyness, I'll, uh, I'll Yes, that, that's why. <laughs> can I, I can always count on you. Uh, uh, but it's uh, more of a uh, comment than a question, I think, but I'd be interested in your response. I'm Gary Feilerman with Joint Commission International, and um, I couldn't help but think, uh, with some of the references to regulation, for example, that uh, there's a real potential here that's not been put on the table for uh, thinking about uh, institution level regulation, if you will, accreditation in some form, uh, that is some orderly process of setting standards. Mm -hmm. We know that a lot, if not most, of this technology is concentrated, consumed, expended at the institutional level. And so it strikes me that there is an overlooked possibility here, a necessity, if you will, for seriously examining systems that will uh, directly impact on the use of the technologies at the institutional level. It's not only the use of, the, of technologies in the usual sense, but for example, on the issue of the competencies of the practitioner. It's a fundamental problem. And it's not just the clinical practitioner. It's the technical practitioner, the engineer. We've got a whole series of issues here that are related, but I think all of this could be surrounded and addressed. Mm -hmm. Let's take two more comments from the audience, and then we'll ask our panelists to respond. Others? Uh, I'm Embry Howell from the Urban Institute. And um, particularly for the Americans, uh, you, citizens of the United States, which I guess a lot of us are, uh, we just, we have the Affordable Care Act, um, and it was explicitly written into it that the findings of the new agency that was going to be set up to do essentially technology assessment could not be used for cost effectiveness purposes to rank procedures, so I'd like for people to comment on the feasibility. We're surrounded by our neighbors now who are moving in a certain direction. Is there any chance that the United States would move in the same direction politically? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. I've thought the same thing myself. Um, we'll make Harvey answer that kind of thing. Um, a, a third question, or shall we turn to our panelists now? Why, why don't you go ahead and... and there's, so, there's, there's a third. Third? third? Yes. Okay, go ahead. I guess it has some relevance. My name is Manoz Harrison. Um, I know that you talked about legislation and uh, regulation and so forth. Um, are we also addressing maybe a policy from point of going from policy to implementation? Um, I'd like a bit of um, light to shine on that one because these policies are adopted, but then where do we go about seeing into what are the gaps um, between policy having been implemented, adopted, yeah. but not implemented, and then what happens? Thanks. Okay. Dr. Roses, would you like well, to comment uh, first? I think that, uh, of course, you know, the, the uh, assessment includes uh, also the competencies and the, the human resources. This is one of the things that is more challenging right now because uh, I think that is very sad, even with the investments, uh, even part of the debt, you know, acquired by some of the countries with loans and so on to build facilities. And then, you know, to acquire technology is not accompanied particularly for two, uh, by two other important resources, the financial resources for the recurring cost of functioning and the human resources. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, you have the infrastructure and the technology, but you don't have, you know, the, 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 the possibility, and this is most of the times uh, overlooked. So uh, we, we pay a lot of attention. But I think that is combining with the policy to implementation. Well, the nature of our organization, you know, is that we accompany the whole process. Uh, so we, we have been around for 110 years, so it's very difficult, you know, to when someone issues a report or so, if you don't have that history, and we are present in every country. And therefore, uh, even the approval of the policy in many occasions has taken 10 or 15 years of discussion. So, you know, yeah. and, and looking for the opportunities and uh, discussions at the parliamentary level, including for the budget, uh, but mm -hmm. also for, as I mentioned, uh, 
the judicial system, which not always, you know, uh, has been on board on some of the things, and, and of course is now therefore uh, the problem, but mm -hmm. I think that they also have the possibility to become part of the solution. So it is really a, a, a combination. On accreditation, I, again, you know, is the way our organization works. I think that uh, we have restrained, we don't have a mandate to accredit anybody from a school of medicine to a technology. So what we have to do is uh, 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 improve the collaboration among the countries, among institutions, to identify different ways of uh, shared accreditation. Some of them by, through reciprocity may adopt, you mm -hmm. know, some of the uh, and, and shared, you know, and, and uh, uh, move along. But also uh, the way we have been working in terms of uh, the certification of the regulatory agencies in the region, which is a, a, a very active process right now, uh, is uh, uh, through South-South cooperation, but also in defining a common set of criteria that all the countries agree are the critical ones, mm -hmm. and these will be like the checklist, you know, for the process of certification, and they participate jointly. So, for instance, if we go for a mission to certify the the regulatory agency in Brazil, there will be people from the US, Canada, Mexico, Colombia, even other regions, you know, or the European mm -hmm. uh, uh, regulatory agency. Because also, this is a world, a globalized world, well, and the goods and services move around uh, that we have to bring, you know, a certain common set of criteria to the industry. Mm -hmm. But also, we need to uh, uh, be sure that we provide the public with the reassurance that these decisions are not biased. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's the whole process that needs to be collaborative uh, in a way that uh, uh, everybody is measured and uh, seen by the others, mm -hmm. and they are, have also the possibility to participate. So this is uh, uh, the way the organization operates, which uh, then, you know, uh, gives some of the um, maybe larger scope than we have presented in terms of moving from the knowledge base, you know, and support to innovation to uh, the uh, use of, of, of the products. Uh, so we, we cover the whole scope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. Uh, just to comment uh, briefly on the three very interesting and important uh, points. Uh, first, on the question of institutional level accreditation as a tool for enhancing technology assessment, but even more technology deployment and use. I think it's a very interesting idea. In a way, uh, I think you could uh, say that already in accreditation, whenever you're looking at something, for example, like infection control in a hospital, whether there are procedures for the uh, use of per approval of particular antimicrobials that could uh, be uh, related to the emergence of of uh, resistant strains and so on, you're already on the verge of uh, standards of accreditation that have implications for the way technology is being used. What I think is very hard would be for accreditation level decision making about an institution to be expected to carry through all the way to uh, every important consequential choice that a professional will make within the institution. Uh, what we do see, of course, is that those institutions, not by virtue of accreditation, but by virtue of organization, culture, and incentives, for example, the prepaid systems, where uh, you have a managed care responsibility, you find very different patterns of technology use compared to the fee-for-service uh, systems which are designed to reinforce volumes of service. So. Uh, Institution level intervention, I think, could be very influential. Accreditation to a degree, but I think it will take more than that. So, a uh, very interesting uh, point to raise in terms of technology. On the second uh, question, uh, in the Affordable Care Act, there is established the entity called the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is intended to do comparative effectiveness. It is directed not to look at cost. Uh, I would have to say personally, that seems to me a deficiency in design of the, uh, of the provision. And over time, I would hope that uh, as a nation in the United States, we would be able to come to grips with a question of cost as well as uh, efficacy and safety. All have to 
play a part uh, in decision making. So uh, right now I would agree that there are opportunities that we're beginning uh, in the U.S., but in the uh, current model, we're not adequately utilizing all the available information to guide sensible choices. And that's uh, something that we have room to improve on. Uh, on the third point uh, about the importance of moving all the way to implementation, isn't it really uh, the implementation side that makes all the difference? I agree completely. A any of our policies, practices, organizations, that stop short of translating into actual practice and what happens have failed in their opportunity, if not their responsibility. So uh, I think you've raised a very important uh, point for uh, design and uh, management of all of our uh, systems intending to make technology better used for the improvement of health. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist. I evaluated some health and professional. I'll start again. Uh, hi, I'm Mindy Reiser. I evaluated health and professional education programs in Central Asia and the Caucasus. And my question has to do with technology for education for healthcare professionals. One of the challenges is there may be priorities for training for maternal and uh, child care um, medical people, nurses, physicians. People come, WHO gets consultants, they train the trainers, and then the trainers come in. There are seminars, people leave. Questions aren't answered, the techniques are not really learned, and I'm wondering what can be done in terms of using the interesting work that's going on now with using educational technology to keep reinforcing that. You may know that at Stanford they've been giving these monster courses in artificial intelligence free to people all over the world. They've had 100,000 students or so. I'm not saying that's the magic bullet, but what is a recurring problem in development is people come in, they train, and it languishes. It seems to me you may have wonderful priorities, but if the techniques are not reinforced, they die. Yeah, I just I want to add a comment on the, you know, just saying, the, setting something as a priority is only the first step, but it has a great advantage if it's linked to money. Because if you say what you'll pay for, then you know what to measure afterwards. So that, that's why we talk about upstream priority setting. But one of the very important limitations of this area is that it's not a, you know, adoption, it's not deployment in use, and that's why tracking and evaluation of what happens is so important and whether, you know, you really have all the things in place to actually be able to deliver the technology um, that's approved. Um, Alexandri, would you want to say something? I wanted to ask you a question. Alexandri is the lead person at PAHO working on Redetsa, which is the new network. I, could you say something about um, the two things you like to see Redetsa accomplish by the end of 2013? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it's one of the challenges, it's also regarding implementation, is, is how we can address really, uh, Dr. Uh, Rose's uh, talk about the cycle, uh, regulation, incorporation, rational use. So that's, uh, uh, I, think, I think, I mean, it's a wonderful uh, proposal, uh, but it's really challenging to, to achieve this. So, uh, Amanda, you asked me about uh, uh, what I can see in the, in the, in the coming until 2013. Uh, we, start, we start working on trying to, to, to fill the gaps. Uh, and one of the gaps is uh, having the regulatory bodies, regulatory authorities, having more closer to HCA bodies and decision making uh, regarding cooperation. So there's, a, there's an issue that I have been participating in the HCA meetings for the last uh, 12 years. And in the last three, three, two, three years, there's a, there's a hot topic. It's putting the, the, the regulatory bodies in the same table to discuss with HCA bodies. And then uh, trying to find uh, what kind of evidence uh, we, we can use for decision-making process. That, uh, we in, and then we figure out that the evidence that the, age, the regulatory agencies are, are looking, sometimes they're not uh, useful for uh, the, the decision-making process uh, uh, just one month afterwards the decision. So that's a, that's a very, very important topic. And uh, the other day, we, we, I, I was in Canada in the meeting uh, organized by Health Canada. And we invite 
uh, in Health Canada and in, in CADF, that's the Canadian Drug uh, HCA, uh, Canadian Agency, and to discuss. And it was really great because uh, I think and then they can really uh, uh, see what are the common challenges and what can we uh, they can interact. Uh, and th that's that's when, and, and Dr. Rose mentioned the, the Pandora network. And the Redats. Uh, so this is we're starting having this dialogue, and 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 then the next step is talk about the 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 the, the use because it is sometimes you you devote so many time look at the HCA reports and studying cost effectiveness and that okay uh, it is very cost effective you can incorporate it into health system and two years afterwards you just forgot about it but this the, the technology is not effective anymore. Uh, so you, you, in, in, you don't follow, and in, you, you, the, the clinical guidelines are we cannot re uh, uh, doing this feeding the back uh, and 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 to see it, and to, to to close the whole system. So this is one of the challenges that we we look for. Okay. Uh, I mentioned one, but I think it's a good. It's a, it's a huge one. That's no, a but yeah. responding to the to the educational technology as well. You know, ten years ago, the region established PAHO established. Uh, Support of the countries, the virtual campus on public health. So we have, you know, like 20 years of distance learning, and this is a collaborative effort of more than 30 uh, uh, universities because, of course, PACO is not an educational institution. And so the certification of the education is to be done by those who are have the mandate. And so this virtual campus is a, a huge platform, you know, where we use all kind of technologies. Everything that we do comes, uh, you know, in webinars, in videos, professors, you know, put their lectures there, and it's available for the people. And the universities, of course, package some of these courses. Uh, so you may have, you know, here we have our uh, regional advisor on ethics and so on. You can. Uh, combine different uh, packages, uh, specific courses, but also in a modular. Uh, and we support the uh, health science uh, institutions, educational institutions. I mean, health science because it's not only medicine, nursing, and nutrition, and you know, sanitary mm -hmm. engineers and whatnot. Um, in in acquiring, you know, also the capacity to prepare. Uh, the methodologies for distance learning and also training the, the mentors and tutors because of course you know distance learning is great but you also need uh, you know individualized uh, support and dialogue and, and discussions and so so uh, we have gone you know we have a, a health promoting schools at the elementary level at secondary level the virtual campus on public health and we have uh, radios and TVs that we support, you know, with messages. So all kind of education from public information and community education to uh, graduate and postgraduate. Just to add a word also on the education question. Uh, this area is one that uh, within the Institute of Medicine, we uh, had our recent annual meeting focused on health professional education. And we also have initiated a new forum we call the Global Forum on Health Professional Development. And this forum is a very important gathering because it's looking at the problem across a spectrum of health professions and a spectrum of countries. These are not problems that are just localized anymore, especially with the movement of people across borders. So that's very important development. I personally love to hear all of the examples about uh, about the web-based, electronic-based outreach, uh, what they're good for, what their limitations are. I can tell you, uh, uh, for example, another example, Amanda's uh, alma mater uh, recently uh, joined uh, with MIT the program called edX, which is a uh, co cooperative higher education, not simply materials, but full courses being uh, put forward. Uh, others have started to join that also, University of Texas, UC Berkeley. And the f one of the first two courses uh, is one from the Harvard Public Health School on epidemiology and biostatistics. The first weekend it was announced, they had 40,000 people enroll in that course. So uh, it's a very exciting vehicle to reach very large numbers of people very rapidly. My own dream about education uh, and technology is actually that in uh, future with the 
availability of health information systems that uh, are, are really enabling the care of individual patients. They'll be linked to decision support systems, to evaluative information, and to real-time relevant education. It won't be that you'll take the course about the patient you saw eight months ago. You'll get online instruction offered on the case that you're now taking care of. And that'll be very different. And if we come to a world where that technology is available and as it gets cheaper, more and more widely deployed, I think it can make a real difference in the performance of health professionals in real time with patients. There's another piece, you know, that I think that is complementing what you said about uh, uh, education in incorporation of the technology uh, and also the health technology assessment, is all this movement of e-health mm. and telemedicine and so on. Because, you know, the fact is that we tend to see these things in isolation, but mm. they are very important because they all contribute, you know, to make a... Uh, the, the, finally the results we expect. Mm -hmm. It's not one that will suffice. So that's why you are asking you know, about the different pieces. And we fail to show, you know, that the, this is more than what we are just presenting. On the issue of prioritization, you know, uh, and priority set, I think it's a tremendous challenge. And we face <coughs> that, you know, even when we s decide from our institution, like you do with yours and so on, even you with here with the CDC, uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to organize your program of work? And so, so uh, this is constant, you know, priority setting. So we decided, because there's also a, a tremendous problem right now, which is influencing the public choices in the health sector in particular, to go, you know, with a list of diseases. You know, and even in, in terms of prioritizing what are the things that the World Health Assembly is going to address, there's a lot of, of, of pressure, mm -hmm. you know, and interest groups. So one is fighting to bring a resolution on autism. You know, so you can go from A to Z, okay? Is that going to improve the people's health? We know that it won't. We know, you know, that having the encyclopedia of diseases mm -hmm. is not going to solve it. Uh, because we have to go to the common factors, to the determinants, to the health systems as determinant, mm -hmm. and so on. So we decided to break the whole fashion, you know. <laughs> and uh, in my proposal for these 10 years that I have worked, we decided to put as priority setting framework, the first thing is the unfinished agenda in public health, which is a kind of moral imperative. Uh, because we were at that time very much influenced by the burden of disease methodology, which is great and has brought a lot of uh, mm -hmm. good benefits. But also, uh, it is a trap. Because then, you know, those who are living with leprosy, which are 0.1% per thousand, mm -hmm. you know, are you going to leave them? Are you going to leave, you know, with these biblical diseases and so on, where we have all the technology, the knowledge, the cheap interventions and everything just because they don't weigh into the population health? Well, this is a moral thing. So the unfinished agenda is important, and you have to look into that. Then the protection of the achievements, because in health, it is so important to look at these minor issues, you know, that are mm -hmm. in the society that you have to close the book, but also looking at the scenarios and trends. But you need to protect your achievements, because it is incredible how you can go backwards. Look at what happened, for instance, in the famous report from the World Bank, you know, dying too young in the Soviet, former Soviet re, uh, Union. I mean, you can, it's the only time when the uh, a po a huge population went back five years of life expectancy with no war. Huh? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, uh, and the final uh, block was facing the challenges. No? And so we started there looking at non-communicable mm -hmm. diseases and so on. So I think that we have to innovate also mm -hmm. in what are the criteria of priority setting. And there's no one criteria. It depends on the nature of the chair you're, you are sitting. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, if you are in a hospital, it won't be like PACO, of course, you know. And even PACO is not the same as the World Health Organization. <laughs> but I think that, and the IOM is not the same as the CDG. But you have to be innovative also in priority setting. Because I think that if we get trapped in the old <coughs> concepts of priority setting, we are not going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And the future, uh, this world moves so fast that the future is already past. Mm -hmm. 
So we're already dated. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess the reception's already over then. That's right. That's right. So we've reached the end. I think that was a great place to stop because Mirta is also pointing out that the global health funders and international agencies also are setting priorities every day or not setting those priorities. Mm. And most importantly, I feel that a priority should have something to do with your money, where your money goes. And I think that's really, uh, although it sounds like common sense, one of the principal insights of the working group report. So with that, uh, we'll conclude. Thank you so much. I think this was a great discussion. And thanks to all of you for coming out. And we'll have a small reception in the next room. Thank you.